And yeah, we'll be getting to that Octo Strange track a little later on in the show off the album The Eighth Continent. I think that's Pluto. Pretty sure that's Pluto. But we have Jasper Ramirez in the studio here, new co-host, myself, Dan Wu, unquestionable, here on KZSE Santa Cruz, Sunday paper, journalists who are still paid to research things that we don't have time to, and this very, very worthwhile profile of Barbara Lee is in the San Francisco Chronicle. And Barbara Lee, they start off, I think, with one of the most important things to know about Barbara Lee, and they profile it very well, is on September 14th, three days after September 11th, 534 members of Congress, that's 100 members of the Senate and 434 members of the House of Representatives, voted for a bill that gave basically unfettered access to authority for the executive branch of our government to wage war. And the measure that she voted against reads as such. It's very simple, which sounds good, but often in laws, if it's very simple, that means that it's very vague. And Jasper is going to read that verbatim right now yes. to let you know what she voted against and how people reacted to it is what we're going to get into. Yeah, I'm on, here on the Wikipedia page. The authorization for use of military force against terrorists. The authorization granted the president the authority to use all, quote, necessary and appropriate force, quote, against whom he determined, planned, authorized, committed, or aided the September 11th attacks. I wonder if this would have been void if Hillary Clinton was elected based on that wording. <laughs> but either way. They. Ooh. Nice. Yeah. I've been burning Jasper's brain with the they, them pronouns lately. So nice one. Got me back. I'm getting it. Slowly, uh, slowly but surely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I saw Jasper at the store. They were buying some tomatoes. Hey. It works. But uh, yeah, so this authorization gave the president... Without a deadline, without an end date, unauthorized use of force against any and all groups, organizations, persons, or nations who have or might in the future commit any acts of international terrorism against the United States. And by extension, it's been used to include the allies of the United States or businesses associated with the United States that have assets overseas. And people might be wondering why the San Francisco Chronicle is writing this long piece about Barbara Lee and a vote that she made in 2001 that was very controversial, earned her death threats, earned her hate mail, Probably. earned her nicknames that are still being thrown around by many people. But, but Jasper, why do you think that they're writing about this article now, 17 years later, 18 years later almost? Probably because the House just voted to repeal the 2001 authorization. Oh, man. And also... The House Representatives and the Republican Senate recently voted to curtail our ability to help Saudi Arabia in their war against Yemen or within Yemen against insurgent groups there against the wishes of the president and in a very, very rare moment. But it just shows how her one vote as one person, and, and this is coming from a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz, where even Anna Eshu, Sam Farr at the time, voted to authorize this use of force. Nancy Pelosi voted for it at the time. Everyone voted for it at the time, except for Barbara Lee. And now it's gotten to the point where even mass amounts of Republicans are turning their 
gays to um to addressing these things in a way where Congress actually has the ability to authorize use of force, which they haven't really done in a war declaration the way it's written in the Constitution since 1941, including the Vietnam War, the Korean War. I know this is stuff that most people, a lot of people know this stuff, but then you have something like this on top of all the use of force authorizations by Congress, and then in 2001, we just full on just free open source that to the president and said, you know what, no matter who the president is, if you think we need to use force, you go ahead and use that force. Mm -hmm. And even by the time of her next election in 2002, October, 2002, they were already pushing for war in Iraq and 133 members of the house and 23 members of the Senate joined her by voting against that authorization. But the damage had already been done because they didn't need to authorize use of force by then because this was already on the books. Yeah, and I think it's all, um, you know, being dredged up here again because of what's happening in Iran and who the president is. That could be. And also there's a lot of people running for president right now instead of just running for office in their local areas which is really, really necessary because last time we got a even pseudo-liberal president elected, he didn't have any local officials or House of Representatives to really help him most of the time or governor's houses to help him at the time. So we have 23 people running for president right now, and if you look back at their records, all of them that have been in office before this they don't have the Barbara Lee record to actually say that they were against these things to begin with, although they're all, even the ones that didn't stand up for these things back then are all jumping on the bandwagon and saying Barbara Lee was right. You know, and that's good. I think that's good to come around to realizing these things at a certain point. I'm not going to fault someone for changing, but at yeah. the same time, I don't think they can claim credit for taking these stances like she can correct i mean what she did took uh took a lot of bravery um, she's the one person to to go against the tide and um you know even though she's in a safe district i still think that um i still think that that was a good example a really good example to set for everybody else that does her job and it's not that she wasn't in favor of taking some action to respond to the World Trade Center and Pentagon attacks on September 11th. That's not at all what she was talking about. But it profiles here how they had the vote the night of the September 11th memorial on September 14th, 2001, which I also think is probably way too quick to have a memorial for that type of thing, honestly. Like, things were still on fire, literally. And so for, for the company country to move that quickly in the direction of just all-out warfare and for her to keep her head together enough and talk to her father who was a veteran and talk to religious figures that she respected and to talk to a lot of people and be like I'm really conflicted about this like obviously something needs to be done we can't just let people do this to our country or any country but at the same time writing a blank check without a plan in place doesn't seem like a good idea. And it just shows you how a lot of right-thinking people, I'm not demonizing them either for voting for it in a lot of cases. Some I probably would, yeah, demonize for it because they still just push for this all the time. There's a lot of people in office that just push for this type of thing all the time. But there's a lot of people that are very, very well thought out people but that fog of that moment was so strong, and I think that has to be highlighted about how much she kept her head together to even be able to make that decision and be able to explain it in a way where even her own voters weren't like, what is this? What are you doing? Correct. I mean, no matter what your politics are, um, somebody that believes something and sticks up for it against, you know, the flowing tide, uh, that's, definitely, uh, that's definitely a positive trait for somebody that's in office. You know, I, I certainly disagree with her on a number of issues, but um, 
I gotta say it was a it was a it was a very valiant move. Absolutely, absolutely, says Daniel from a dark steel cavern, apparently right there. Uh, and in honor of that, we do have a premiere of a new song, and I just wanted to highlight this uh, this profile a bit, and and just. I just want to give Barbara Lee a little credit for, for all of that, and it's not to rag on Sam Farr or on SU and uh, maybe Jimmy Panetta, the new representative from this area. Most of the places you guys are listening on the broadcast right now through Monterey County and most of Santa Cruz County and San Benito. Um, it's not to rag on him or Sam Farr or anything. It's just to give extra credit to Barbara Lee because those representatives did end up joining her fairly quickly in these causes once they were able to like get their heads back together and listen to some people and and think about the can of worms that conflicts always open and I don't want to separate that into being like oh you can't have conflicts in the Middle East without it being a can of worms you can't have conflicts like that anywhere without it being a can of worms because people die and then like rationality goes out the window at that point and pallets of money disappear and then we don't know what's going on anymore and then you have to deal with all those problems and that usually requires more drastic measures to try and fix those problems in the aftermath and so in honor of that, we're going to premiere a track that just by name kind of fits the situation. This track is by the group Octo Strange. The Eighth Continent is the album. And the track is Alone, in parentheses, by myself. Lap and slide guitar, Matt Young. Saxophone, Mason Oram. Backup vocals, Mikey Holter. Ben Hameen and Mason Oram and lead vocals and lyrics by Allison Ducky Moppin.
Thank you so much to Octo Strange. That track is alone off their album, The Eighth Continent. Although it, they told me it's the Eighth Continent, but it's more like an alpha Greek letter delta, sort of a delta without the bottom of the triangle there. I forgot to mention that on piano, synths, and drum machine, we got Hanshan on there. And on bass, we have Tovin. So... That is that crew, Octo Strange, that came to my attention today, and I listened to it, and I thought, I'm going to put that on the show. Speaking of putting things on the show, because they came to my attention, I went rock climbing at a gym, fake rock climbing, you know, because I'm a poser. Uh, honestly, just I don't have time to get out to the places I want to climb very often, so I've always gone to a climbing gym. And I walked in there, and I ran into a friend I hadn't seen in probably eight years. It had been uh, a while. Mr. Jasper, and he turned to me, and he's like, hello. And I was like, wow, your <laughs> voice hasn't changed at all. You still talk like an albatross from medieval <laughs> times, um, lording over your dominion. Mm. But he and I have these long conversations about all kinds of things. We were outside the station the other night when we came here and were completely unproductive and just ate gushers and watched random videos and looked at the record collections here for like three hours. But then we ended up discussing things outside when we decided to leave and we we're like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> we stood out in the rainy, almost rainy fog for an hour and just talked and talked and talked about politics and philosophy and everything. I want to treat this first episode with Jasper as sort of an introduction to who this person that would waste their time being the co-host of a show with Dan Wu, who he is. And so what the San Francisco Chronicle did for us was they wrote about this crazy chef in San Francisco who wants to start a waste-free restaurant. A waste-free restaurant. just happens that Jasper fancies himself as a chef and so my first question is very open-ended what did you think when you explored this for a minute with me what do you see as a waste-free restaurant and what do you think about the idea well i think it's uh obviously it's a really good idea um i also think that waste free and restaurant is sort of uh you know those two things don't go together um that being said i'll say that a lot of places that i've worked um you know it's deeply ingrained in kitchen culture to waste as little as possible uh, there's two sayings one is haste makes waste waste not want not and uh it's a big part of kitchen culture and part of that comes from you know the slim margins that restaurants operate on so you can maximize your food cost but also, um, a lot of places in the Bay Area in particular, and people that I've worked with out here, are, are really thinking about how they can minimize their impact on the environment. Um, you know, with a restaurant, you're going to have waste. You're going to use a lot of water. 
Um, obviously, the you know most sustainable thing to do would be to grow your vegetables in your yard and cook them over fire in the backyard. But um, that's not the world we live in. So it's really cool to see people are being proactive about composting, about recycling, which I'm sure we'll get more into uh, later in this episode or next week. Um, and just overall sustainability. And um, yeah, it's really it's really been a big thing in the Bay Area and, and a lot of chefs are, are, are really about it. And when you have new regulations about straws and containers and stuff like that, I mean, it's really a no-brainer. It's really a no-brainer. And most people jump at the cause to make their establishment as sustainable as possible. It's also a really cool thing to do right now too. So, you know, it goes hand in hand. Absolutely. And a little teaser on that topic before we go into other parts of you being a chef is that we are going to have a show on recycling next week and hopefully have a representative of Greenpeace come on and talk about some of their research into the issue, where recycling goes, what happens to it, the new movement that is sparking up to tell people to stop recycling. And sometimes it's very cynical like stop recycling because it doesn't do anything and by the way climate change isn't real and here's our one study to show that and then in a lot of ways it's telling you that that triangle we learned about as kids the reduce reuse recycle triangle that they told us about when we were in elementary school through the 90s probably the late 80s as well people seem to only myself included sometimes pay attention to the recycle part of it and the reduce reuse part of it is a big thing and you're talking about straws and cups and all of these things this restaurant is going to have no to-go cups you're gonna have to bring your own cup if you want to take something to go you're gonna have to bring your own packaging if you want to take it to go if you want to buy a bunch of snacks for your employees because you're doing the lunch run you need to bring your own bag to carry the things out and these are not things that people are used to here and a lot of places like uh, Japanese culture for instance they a lot of Japanese people and Korean people have often asked me to and and other places but I know those two specific places will ask me for a plastic bag and then when I give them the one they're like can I have another one because they're so used to having things double bagged just in case it breaks and on the other end of the spectrum I remember going backpacking through Europe and going to a grocery store in Spain, in Barcelona. Luckily, it was just across the street, basically, from the hostel I was staying at. But I bought, like, 12 things, and when I got to the front of the line, they were like, oh, where's your bag? And I was like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. This was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, then you're, you're, you're out of luck. Sorry. Good luck. And I had to walk kind of half drunk across the street with, you know, 10 different shaped things in my arms because they were like, yo, this is our policy. We don't have packaging. Get used to it. And that kind of behavioral, like, shock therapy, I feel like was much more effective there than paying 20 cents a bag here is because people just pay the 20 cents because that's not that much money to a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. Whereas the shock therapy of just, like, no more packaging, people learn it real quick because if you want the stuff from that store or from this cafe, you're going to bring your own packaging. Yeah, it might seem like kind of a pain in the butt to begin with, but once you you get started on it, it's it's really a no-brainer. You know, when it comes to bringing your bags to the grocery store, anything like that. Um, but it's it's a long game issue. I mean, it's not something that changes overnight. You know, you change the culture, change people's habits. Um, and sometimes it takes legislation to make that happen. But I think what we were going to talk about next week was also what happens to the recycling after we're done. With right. It. If you don't avoid and reuse and reduce the stuff that we do put in the recycle bins, what has happened to it, what is happening to it, what's the next step in that industry. Where does it go? Slash, is it an industry anymore? Because it's closing down as an industry Mm -hmm. in a lot of places that it was. We will be exploring that next week on Unquestionable. Like I said, Jasper's going to be around for a couple weeks as a co-host, but we're going to carry on this project in some new form going forward, which I'm really excited about because... I love doing this show and I love getting my thoughts out and I love hearing from listeners, but my apologies to people when I don't have a guest and I do too much research and my untreated ADD just spews out onto the radio waves for you guys. And I get it. It's hard to call in sometimes with the topics I make. So I'm really glad to have a conversational partner 
to either call me stupid when I'm doing it and like have open roasting abilities and also to bounce off each other to like have a conversation that people can actually listen to. And speaking of which, we do have a listener who texted in at 831-459-4036. Speaking of open roasting, the question goes, growing your own backyard veggies, what's the sustainable fuel to cook them over? So let's say you're talking about growing veggies, maybe certain ones at the restaurant to or near the restaurant to save on energy costs of shipping and all of these things and only grow as much as you need. Uh, what would be your next step as a chef? What would you promote as the most sustainable fuel that wouldn't be wasteful? Well, uh, that's a really complicated question because uh, if you're cooking inside, you're cooking. If it was your restaurant, both taste-wise and sustainability, how do those two come together as well is what I would put in there. Mm. Well, you're not going to see a kitchen with a solar-powered electric oven or an electric range. I mean... You do have some infrared ranges and some high, high-end places, but for the most part, all high-end cooking ranges are gas. Um, I guess the next best thing would be to cook with wood, to grow your own trees and chop it down and dry it. And But then you're burning wood and you're still putting carbon out into the atmosphere. So, I mean, that's a really good question, um, but the answer is definitely not. Not a simple one. If it's at home... If you can have an electric range and you have solar panels on your house, I would say that is definitely uh, the best thing you could do to cook your food environmentally. And what do you think about the idea of, it's kind of a combination of what we were talking about earlier, but like local sourcing obviously cuts down on shipping costs and pollution caused by driving things or flying things or boating things across bodies yeah. of water. But we were also talking about the current standard of demand for a multitude of ingredients. How, and I know you're moving into a new job as part of the reason why you're able to come in here and do all this research with me recently and put together ideas for shows mm -hmm. and go climbing is that you're switching to a new job. But like... What do you think about the difference between the demand for a multitude of ingredients and the demand for people feeling good about where they shop and knowing that it's at least labeled environmentally safe? How do you balance those two things as a chef and how do you plan on balancing them at your new job? Well, I think it's a really it's a really good thing right now, actually, because not only are restaurants more concerned about the environment, um, and where they're sourcing their produce and meat and pantry items. But uh, being able to highlight that you are sourcing sustainably is, is a good sale point as well. I mean, that's what people want to buy. People want to buy organic. They want to buy locally sourced ingredients uh, whenever possible. And if you can provide that to somebody at a restaurant that you're working at, I mean, that is a huge plus. Um, there's a number of local farms where we're very blessed to be in an area where, um, you know, small agriculture is a thing. It sits alongside Big Ag too. Um, but yeah, there's a number of local farms. Um, one is Marikita Farms. And uh, the guy there, Andy, for instance, he, uh, he, the way that he grows vegetables is very special. Um, he talks about crop rotation and the natural weeds that grow around certain plants and basically, you know, not using pesticides and not using industrial fertilizers to be able to accomplish his goal of sustainability and being able to, you know, source restaurants, <clears throat> restaurants with quality ingredients that are in demand right now. Now you talk about the, the image part of it too, and Sometimes there's weird relationships between social movements and corporate engagement and when big business gets into something because it's both good for the world and good for their image. There was a lot of talk, for instance, at, you know, there's a lot of talk at um, Pride, for instance, Pride Parades about corporations sponsoring pride parades 
And is that good for Pride because it brings them more money to have a cooler party and it brings attention through corporate names that people might know when they don't even know about Pride and all these things? Or is it just a way of corporations jumping on a trend? How much do you think in the food business there is of a conflict of those two elements where do you think a lot of companies are doing it just to boost their own profits maliciously? Or do you think that just by them having an incentive to get involved in these movements, it's just inherently a good thing? Well, I think uh, in restaurants, from what I've seen, it's inherently a good thing. It's uh, it's really a happy, uh, happy marriage. Um, because not only are you, um, you know, not only are you sourcing sustainably, you're, you're also providing more value uh, to your product that you're selling. Um, so it, it is a very symbiotic and, and happy, happy relationship um, in terms of pride and, you know, other events like that where, you know, Nike or somebody will capitalize on a social movement to sell more sneakers. Yeah, I, I, I get the parallel. However, um, it does feel somewhat different in the food industry. Um, although, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a happy marriage. And uh, it, I'm sure it can be, too, with uh, companies like Nike and uh, I don't know who else was pushing pride stuff lately. Um, if it brings awareness to a social issue that's of importance, great. Um, if you're doing it to sell sneakers, that's, that's a little weird. But, you know, to each their own. I guess they have to sell sell sneakers to buy the banner. Yeah, no, it, it's a tough one. Trust me, like for me, yeah, I, I'd definitely judge that on a case by case basis. <laughs> yeah, and also a uh, friend Derek sent uh, an article to me from Inhabitat dot com. This Japanese town will be. This is, I guess, uh, a perfectly timed uh, little credit to a uh, part of Japan after I criticized their tradition of having double plastic bags for their packaging. This Japanese town will produce absolutely zero waste by 2020. And it says they already are well on their way. Residents meticulously separate their recyclables into 34 different pins, which makes me feel guilty. This is the writer of the article, which makes me feel guilty for complaining about the three bins at my own city's collection site. So far, only 20% of the city's trash makes it to landfills, while the other 80% is responsibly recycled. A far cry from the old tradition of burning the refuse. So that's that's interesting, and I will definitely include that and not include this video that just started almost playing. Whew, sound was turned off. Nailed it. Um, horribly into the mic from five inches away. We will definitely include some of that in our next show on recycling next week, and we definitely want to hear you guys' views about your first experiences with recycling, if you grew up with it, if you're 70 years old and you were in one of the first communities that was already doing it, or when you first encountered it, how much it pissed you, uh, bothered you. And as a non-commercial educational radio station, KZSE supports free expression of ideas. Please be aware that the opinions expressed are those of the speakers or artists only. Do not necessarily reflect the views of the UC Regents, KZSE staff, management, or underwriters. We welcome your feedback on our programming. Please direct your comments to the Program Review Committee at 831-459-4726 or by email at prc at kzse.org. And I totally know that by heart for no apparent reason. But I will include that in our show on recycling. We'll be asking for your views on recycling and that reduce, reuse, recycle show. And from that standpoint... I want to pivot to another issue that you are very familiar with in the restaurant industry as one of the now better paid people in that industry relatively. You're not you're not like Anthony Bourdain status <laughs> uh, who doesn't even cook food, you know, who didn't even cook food at the end of his career was more of a you know, commentator on it. Um, but you're definitely doing pretty well and a lot of people aren't. And what kind of view do you take that as someone who is now on the upper side of deciding, you know, hiring people, fi having to fire yeah. people occasionally, um, having somewhat of a say in how much they get paid because you can at least 
um, give your opinion to the owner of restaurants in those regards. How do you approach the great disparity for like me as a service worker out in the front house who makes really good money right now, which isn't true of all of them, as opposed to the cooks? And, and how would you suggest someone like me actually does something without blowing up my own status in the world to help that system, you know, maybe pay the back house better? Yeah, well, um, it's interesting. Um, there's been a number of different schools of thought on sort of how to close the gap between the front and the back. Um, on one hand, um, a lot of people I know have, you know, used front of the house kitchen or front of the house restaurant work to be able to support a family and have, you know, I, I know single parents that that's what they do and they've done it for years. And I know people that have been able to buy houses and live a life and stay in this area. Um, because of the amount that you get paid when you're serving. I mean, you're a lot of times getting 20% of a tab. Um, and, you know, you have people in the back that are a lot of times being paid minimum wage or a little bit higher than that. Um, as generally a back-of-the-house manager, you always want to pay those people more. However you get to a place, systems are already there. People are used to making what they're used to making. Um, also, if you're going to you know, take money out of the back end of the restaurant out of sales, uh, to pay kitchen workers more. Uh, sometimes that's not always the most realistic thing to do because restaurants, they work on a pretty slim profit margin in general. It's a pretty, it's a pretty ruthless industry. What do you think about places and, and generally it's in higher cost of living areas where yes a lot of people are struggling to make ends meet but they're higher cost of living because there are a small percentage of people that are making enormous amounts of mm -hmm. money yeah. seattle boston san francisco where some restaurants are experimenting with putting a three percent surcharge on there so it's not a voluntary tip and it's not a tax that goes to the government it's literally instead of me giving 10% of my tips to the kitchen like I do, mm -hmm. split between four people. It's like four or five people. I'm only able to give them like 2% each of my tips. Yeah. Um, reasonably, because I still have to tip out other people. And then these restaurants are just putting a 3% tax on the bill for the customer that goes straight towards the cooks. If you have five cooks back there, that's still only 0.6% of the tab going to each cook. What, but what do you think about that being a proposed idea to bridge this gap? Well, I mean, I think that, um, like anything helps at this point. I know in a lot of cities, uh, restaurants, uh, res staffing is always an issue, uh, for restaurants in front and the back of the house. Um, and a lot of cities like San Francisco, for instance, uh, most people that are cooks in kitchens um, cannot afford to live in those cities. So they end up having to, you know, live, you know, if you're in San Francisco, maybe you live in Belmont or Pacifica or Oakland even. And you need to make the commute to get into the city <clears throat> because, you know, places to live around a restaurant are just not affordable. So I, I would say any bit helps for that. I'm personally somebody that has no problem paying that extra 3% because I've seen firsthand how how the housing crisis here in the Bay Area has spread out and affected people, especially in this industry. It's a growing concern. It, it really is. Staffing is a, is a huge concern for restaurants right now, uh, it's just being able to pay people. And you're not going to be working at a single restaurant going forward, correct? Uh, correct. Um, I'm doing some task force stuff, so I'll, I'll be, I'll be in one city, then in another city a couple months after that. So what kind of consulting are you doing at these places? Like, what do you anticipate your job as opposed to what you've been doing, which is a lot of the prep work or training people on how to prep the recipes and kind of the supervisory role and stepping in and covering breaks and actually cooking in the restaurants. What are you moving into now that's going to be different and and what do you see your job as being that you're going to start in a couple of weeks well it's similar it's similar it's a it's a larger it's a larger company um and basically they just send you to wherever they need help you find the busiest place in the kitchen and you put yourself in the middle of it and you know it has to do with training you you really just 
find where the work is and you do the work and you try to make things better for people that work there. And have you ever worked in the, the front house of a restaurant? Mm, no. Because it's very interesting when when I get in these these heated moments in the kitchen at our work where there's people that are qualified to work in the front and it comes down to, you know, yo, we need that food right now. We need it. We need it to go out. Like, we have all the other things ready for that. And, like, those people are, like, yelling at us out front. Like, we need that right now to go and they're like basically pointing out in that moment you know what you make more than us out there and like you know Mm -hmm. we're we're back here under the heat and like with inadequate fans sometimes and in that moment right and in our culture it's it's the person that shows their face out there and i'm like i i joke with my workers in these heated moments because we know each other well enough where it can be harsh and i'm just like you know you can work out here and talk to those people and literally like two of them on a routine basis like no i don't want to do that (laughs) i don't want to go out there and talk to people on a daily basis and so like how much of it is the choices that people make you mentioned the term bootstraps as far as yourself getting to this point without culinary school or anything like Mm -hmm. that um how much of these systems can be attributed to them being very imbalanced in a corrupt way, in a way that should be fixed? Mm-hmm. And how much of it is you chose to work in the kitchen so it's hot and sweaty, but you don't have to talk to customers. But is it still fair that the pay is that inequitable? Yeah, it's a pretty common place conversation in restaurants. Um, what I would say to that is um, as somebody that walked into a restaurant with no experience and had to learn on the job. Um, basically it's an unstable industry and with instability generally comes more opportunity. Um, and I found myself, um, it was a lot, it helped a lot to have the mindset of, I don't want to do this for this, for this wage forever. And I looked at people around me and I, I I just looked at myself as a manager and I managed everything I had control over and I worked, I worked really hard to, um, deal with the issues that arose that I didn't have control over. And, uh, I always had the mindset of looking upwards and onwards. And I always had the mindset of if this isn't going to work for me and I'm not going to be happy, then I'm going to go do something else. And it might sound a little cold, however, it's just the way the industry is set up. I mean, if you are making a low wage in the back of the house and, you know, there's a kind of fundamentally flawed system between the front and the back, um, if you shouldn't sit around and complain about it. I mean, there, there's definitely things that you can do. There's definitely things you can do to better your own situation. Um, that's not to say people don't have bad luck and you know but I've, I've also seen a lot of people that have stagnated in the industry because they haven't had the drive and haven't jumped at the opportunities um you know put in front of them and also to the four people that read our facebook teaser for this show i want to touch on something you were reading a lot about today and give you a couple minutes to talk about your thoughts on something completely non-restaurant related but oh, also yeah. an interest of yours which are <clears throat> the 17 uh, Illuminati members that were arrested in Iran. <laughs> Can you tell us about that situation going on that's totally developing? There's not a lot of concrete evidence in yet, but the LA Times has a piece out. And uh, can you talk about the lizard people that got um, arrested in Iran? Yeah, it looks like Iran claimed today that it had smashed a CIA spy ring on its soil saying some of the 17 Iranian nationals netted by authorities had already been sentenced to death. Yeah. And what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Initially, it totally could be aspiring of people we recruited from Iran. It could be a lot of things. It could be Iran just making something up. What's your, you read, you read more about this during our research session earlier. So what's your impression after what you read? Cause I was reading about other stuff. Yeah, well, Mike Pompeo obviously says it's part of the nature of the Ayatollah to lie to the world. And Iran is being very, uh, you know, yeah, they they lie as well. We lie. (laughs) We lie. They lie. I mean, it's really hard to, uh, you know, have an opinion about something where you don't, you're you're 
pretty positive. The one thing you can make positive is that you're not getting the full story from either end and that you're not going to anytime soon. So it's, it's really hard to, you know, have a real opinion. <laughs> it's really hard to have a real opinion about it. All right. Well, I mean, yeah, Mike Pompeo saying that he is telling us that the Ayatollah's nature is to lie. My personal impression of that is to laugh, but I have a very unappealing laugh to go out that loudly on the <laughs> air, so I will spare everyone that idea. But we're going to be transitioning from this episode of Highly uh, Unquestionable with Jasper Ramirez and myself, Dan Wu, here in a minute. And thank you so much for Jasper for coming in, helping me out with the show the last couple of weeks. He's going to be here next week for the recycling show, and we'll see where it goes from there. But thank you for giving us a chance oh, to you, find out who just appeared on the air asking questions <laughs> last week of Sabine El Hamail. We have that episode with the director of Generation Zapped up on KZSE.org talking about the real or possible or needing more research risks of Wi-Fi and cell phone technology up on KZSE.org as a podcast, Unquestionable. Generation Zapped was that documentary. That is also available in many places. And I got a text here. Um, oh, yeah, from my mother. Uh, they, walk, they wear the sneakers, she wrote, and I said, who? And she writes, many people that walk in or watch the, parade, the pride parades realized my statement was unclear, as our family often <laughs> does not realize until afterwards. Uh... But, yeah, she was talking about the hardworking people that are in the parades wearing the Nike sneakers. I just figured out what that connection was. Uh. Wow. Our brains do work in very similar unclear ways. Shout out to my hazy lineage. Um, but we're going to go back to the show Highly Questionable on the back end of this conversation. We're going to have some music coming up for you for the next hour in the jazz, punk, and hip-hop region of musical history. But as a throwback and in honor of Allison, Ducky, Maupin and their new project, Octo Strange, with Tovin and Lyrical Eye and all kinds of folks appearing on that project, here's Mirrors by Homebrew, their previous incarnation. We'll be back here on KZSE Santa Cruz in... Just about three or four minutes. We're, we're going to play a song called Mirrors for you today. Okay. I am a coward, though, and blinded like a sow. I am a rainstorm and some progress can't escape from myself i 
was a decade. 